uh, interest to you, if you're licensed in the state of Utah still, is that there has been a temporary suspension of live continuing education requirements across all professions in the state of Utah. And that currently applies to those um, professions with expiration dates between now and the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. Who knows when the end of the COVID-19 pandemic will be at this point. Uh, we, I believe we're still in a state uh, emergency situation, but um, so our licenses in, in Utah um, may or may not still be in that, but you can expect more information, um, particularly from the Board of Pharmacy regarding any continued suspension of, of the live CE requirements. Um, another thing that was requested by community pharmacists was that in these times of a lot of our community pharmacies in the state of Utah giving COVID vaccines and um, administering COVID testing, there's a huge demand for pharmacy technicians as you may have experienced in your own practices. And so one of the things that was done to try to help with this is to allow a relaxation of the technician trainee ratio that is in place. And so in December, the board voted to allow for two pharmacy technician trainees to work under the direct supervision of a pharmacist. Um, provided that you have a licensed tech or an intern that is also working at that time. So we don't want a pharmacist just to have two trainee techs, um, but to have other support as well. But hopefully that will um, provide support for our pharmacists, but also provide a, a pipeline for um, pharmacy technicians that is greatly needed in the state. Um, the other thing that happened really early uh, back in April was a um, change in the way that pharmacy interns can be supervised as both the University of Utah and other colleges were struggling with remote rotations. Um, we did have a suspension of the direct supervision requirements. And so right now during the pandemic, there is a general supervision requirement for pharmacy interns such that we can have pharmacy interns on remote, remote rotations if necessary um, so that they can continue uh, in their education. Um, the other things that the Board of Pharmacy was trying to be proactive on, um, as you may know, Board of Pharmacy in the state of Utah is advisory to the Department of Occupational and Professional Licensing. Um, so we can't, we couldn't make a rule that said you can't prescribe hydroxychloroquine, but we did issue two different guidances um, recommending safe and prudent use of um, hydroxychloroquine to support the pharmacists in our state. And also very early on um, ensured that there was standing order policies to allow for pharmacist, pharmacist administration of COVID-19 testing. As well, we already actually had very good laws in place to allow for um, expanded access to vaccines to pediatric patients. So as you may know, in the state of Utah, a pharmacist who is eligible to administer can administer vaccines to a child as young as six months, which is not something that was present in many other states in the country. And actually, um, there was a federal health and human services declaration that now allows this, but we, we actually didn't need to use that because we already had that in place. Um, so some other things, those were kind of the major things that the Board of Pharmacy was working on. And we there are some other things that, um, as I was looking at this, we need to update, like there was a suspension of the need for um, recertification of BLS and for immunization when there was no one that was actually giving BLS classes for recertification. And that will now need to be revisited as that expired December of 2020. Um, so other uh, news that is happening in the state in terms of legislative news, we do have right now in our uh, Senate, a bill, House Bill 178, that it provides for pharmacist prescribing. Um, of prescription drug products as dictated by a committee that would be formed between DOPL and the Department of Health. And this successfully passed um, the House of Representatives. It has passed out of committee in the Senate, notably the Health and Human Services Committee, which is where all the physicians are. 
and is um, waiting to then be voted on by the full Senate. And so that would establish a committee that would make decisions um, regarding what drugs and drug classes would be appropriate for prescribing by pharmacists. And the first drug classes are suggested to be things like smoking cessation, um, moving the contraception and naloxone from a standing order to a prescription process, and other public health related needs like um, pre-exposure and post-exposure um, HIV prophylaxis. So I think a lot of really exciting things um, happening in the Utah legislature now and some opportunities for our students to both advocate for these new laws and, and advocate for the profession of pharmacy. So I could talk forever, but I'm not gonna do that. And I will um, give it back to Kevin or Dean Peterson. Yeah, I can, I can take it back here. Thank you so much, Dr. Gunning for that. And I think I might have some uh, follow-up questions once we get to the Q&A too about the uh, prescribing. So looking forward to that. So um, I don't believe we have uh, Dr. Tyler on with us quite yet either. So um, if it's okay with uh, Carrie Miller, I will turn it over to you to um, talk about industry. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. It's been a while since I've uh, been connected with University of Utah Pharmacy School, but um, I live in Denver now and luckily have an opportunity to travel to Salt Lake uh, pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic um, with my job. So uh, based on the conversation that Dr. Peterson mentioned that we had um, in preparing for this, he had asked me to talk a little bit about my, my career background and kind of what got me to where I am now, because I think you'd probably put it in a little bit of that non-traditional mode. So um, I thought I'm a visual person. So I've actually got a slide that I think helps kind of walk through my, my timeline that I'm going to share with you. And I think it also is relevant because I want to talk not just about the pharmaceutical industry and some of the COVID impact, but can touch a little bit on also kind of the health plan side of things because that's where I spent a good deal of my career. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen and hopefully this will go smoothly. Here we go. All right, can you see my screen now? All right. Um, so let's see, sure I can forward it. There we go. Uh, so I'm a proud University of Utah graduate. Um, as uh, I, I can't remember if you mentioned it, I'm uh, back in the day when it was a bachelor's degree for your to get your license and then moving on to a PharmD degree if you so cho chose, which I did. Um, 89 was my BS, 91 was my PharmD. And I actually see uh, Dr. Orlando on the call with us. And uh, we, we connected way back then. It was nice to see you, Trish. Um, so back in both my bachelor's degree and my PharmD program, I was an intern at LDS Hospital. And then um, post uh, my BS, I actually worked part-time as a pharmacist at the University of Utah Hospital um, while I was working on my PharmD program and then um, decided to take the adventure. I've always loved the clinical side of the world, even though now I'm more on the business side and actually left Utah and went to um, Minnesota. Um, ended up spending 11 long cold years <laughs> in Minnesota, uh, but had an incredible experience doing a fellowship specifically in kidney transplant uh, medicine at the University of Minnesota in conjunction with um, Hennepin County Medical Center. Um, post that transplant is really when I was looking for an opportunity, decided I wanted to stay in Minnesota. There weren't a lot of uh, clinical jobs that really intrigued me. And there was this thing called PBMs that Minnesota was re really kind of the birthplace of the pharmacy benefit managers. And so at the time, I actually took a job with a PBM that was owned by United Healthcare. It was called Diversified Pharmaceutical Services. And 
Um, actually, I, hopefully Dr. Tyler will join us because she was really um, instrumental in my career in terms of developing a love for drug information. And that was really what drew me initially into the PBM industry because my first job um, with uh, PBM, which was eventually bought by Express Scripts, so that's why you see Express Scripts on this timeline, was I, I wrote drug monographs for formulary reviews, and I actually went to P&T committees all over the country, depending upon where our customers were, and presented uh, information and clinical information, so it's always been a, a passion of mine, and still to this day, I love to get involved uh, wherever I can. Um, spent 11 years at Express Scripts and, uh, like I mentioned, was in Minnesota and really missed the West and just had an opportunity to move here to Denver at the time and actually built a pharmacy department at Great West Healthcare, which was a relatively small insurance company, about a million lives, um, and had an incredible experience there kind of moving as a blend between more of the clinical side and the business side. So it was the pharmacy director. So we, we had our own formulary and had to make all those clinical decisions, but I started getting involved in some of the finances and the rebates and, and the, the business side of healthcare. Um, Great West was actually uh, purchased by Cigna. Um, so you'll, you obviously see a lot of dots along this arrow. And in fact, I had to make the arrow a little bit longer today as I was preparing this because um, I've had a lot of job changes and sometimes things happen and I make that change myself. Some things happen to you. And so you're forced to make a change and I've always tried to make the best of, of that process. Um, so with the Cigna transition, I actually decided to go into consulting for a while. Um, didn't stay in consulting for too long, but uh, it was a, a good opportunity to see that side of the business. And then that was really where I decided to move into industry and have pretty much been in industry ever since, starting with Johnson & Johnson, um, moving to a small biotech company based out of um, San Francisco called Medivation, which was actually purchased by Pfizer. And so post the Pfizer purchase, I um, made the move actually back to the health plan at Cigna and actually ran their rebate contracting department. So that was a, a pretty intense job and learned a lot, uh, worked with some of the people that I had worked with back at Great West when Great West was bought by Cigna, but really decided that um, the best place for me from a kind of work-life balance was actually back in the industry side. Um, so I moved into the oncology space and I've always loved, as I mentioned, I spent time doing renal or, you know, kidney transplant. I've loved that immunology space. So I'm now working for a company um, called Blueprint Medicine. I started at Al Nylum in the oncology space and now Blueprint. Um, we're also in the oncology space. So really, I, I think my message is that there are so many different career opportunities for pharmacists these days that sometimes you just don't really even know everything that's out there. In fact, one of the videos that was playing when this meeting started, I heard you know, one of the speakers was saying that there's just so many different opportunities in pharmacy. And um, I mean, I never would have expected I'd land where I am today. Um, I'm really kind of more in a sales role. My customers are actually the insurance companies with Blueprint, so I don't call on physicians, but I work closely with those sales folks that do call on physicians. And so it's, um, again, it's been a, a fun career and something different, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, so just to briefly address kind of what, how COVID has had an impact on the pharmaceutical industry, um, here at Blueprint that I'm where I am right now, we are a very small company based out of Cambridge, Mass, but we actually have our own research and development um, team. And that has been one of those areas that definitely has been impacted by COVID in terms of patient recruitment for clinical trials, um, not just Blueprint, but just the industry in general. Some clinical trials have been you know, put on hold because of concerns with you know, patients getting you know, 
COVID transmission, as well as just a drop, a higher dropout rate of, uh, of patients that may get the virus and have to drop out for a variety of reasons. So that's been um, one impact. And then the research and development itself, um, we actually have the labs in our main office in Cambridge. And so when everything was shut down, the labs were shut down. So there was, there was no progress even on the basic science side for a while. Now that's changed luckily, and they've kind of reinstituted with safety measures. And so they're starting, but again, it's not really completely up to where it was pre-COVID and hopefully will be, uh, will be again soon. On the sales side, and really in terms of where I sit, um, whether it's myself calling on insurance companies or our sales reps that call on the doctors, that's been a dramatic change as well, just because there's no really been no face-to-face. -face. And I've never, I've never gone so long in many years without traveling and actually visiting customers, but we've all gotten very good, as I'm sure all of you have at Zoom meetings and, and telephone calls and every other way we can connect with people. So um, I think it's, you know, it's something that we've all gotten accustomed to, but I think it's had an impact on our ability to really communicate out. In fact, this year, in, or 2020, when 2020 started, Blueprint didn't even have a drug approved by the FDA. So our first two drugs actually got approved during this pandemic. And so communicating out to our customers about new drugs um, has definitely been a challenge. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on the health plan and the PBM side. Um, these, you know, whether it's the health plan or the PBM, I mean, obviously the, the virus itself and um, has had an impact on the patients uh, that, that those companies cover from a benefit perspective. One of the things I really noticed initially with the virus is that whether it was at the health plan level or the PBM level, they were actually changing the benefit design for patients so that they would allow for, you know, typically patients may get a 30 day supply, but they were allowing for 60 and 90 day supplies so that people didn't have to travel or come into the pharmacy as frequently. They were waiving some prior authorization and some other step therapy edits that normally would kind of prevent or slow down the process. So I know they were doing a number of things to try to expedite um, and not create any more barriers um, than already existed and help patients get make sure they got the drugs that they need. So that's just some of the things I've observed, um, whether it's in the pharmaceutical industry, the manufacturer side, or the customers that I work in with day in and day out. And so with that, I'll pass it back to Kevin. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. I always love to hear uh, just the different sides of pharmacy that you can kind of get into. I, I mean, I've also worked in not industry before, but more PBMs with Molina Healthcare and CVS and that kind of thing too. So there's a much more wide world out there than just the regular stuff that we all think about pharmacy too. So, but awesome. Well, um, I still don't believe uh, Dr. Tyler is with us right now. So um, I guess if she happens to join us during this, uh, during the rest of our time, we'll uh, pass the time on to her. But um, I guess at this point, I'd like to kind of open it up for questions for anyone that has for our speakers today, or just generalized questions about the College of Pharmacy that. I might have to pass on to Ryan or Maria to answer too. So um, does anyone have any questions right now? And if not, I have a, uh, I do have a question for Dr. Gunning to start out with for sure. Um, as far as the uh, prescribing bill that went through, uh, um, geez, went through our legislature this year too. What does that entail as far as, is that open to all retail pharmacies out there and retail pharmacists, or is it only specifically for like hospital pharmacy or I guess pharmacists that have access to labs? So really great question. Um, that's what the committee is for to determine 
what are the education and training requirements and what are the um, information requirements that will allow for prescribing. Uh, it's really not, not intended, at least in my opinion, for people who work in the environment that I work at, which is in a family medicine clinic, but really for community pharmacists and as a way to increase access to, to some of these uh, important public health services, particularly in rural areas um, and in areas where there's lower access to primary care services. And so um, this is actually something that a couple of other states have started doing. Colorado is one, Oregon is another. Um, and so really, you know, certainly to prescribe some medications like PrEP, you do need access to labs and you do need to have the ability to get those in and interpret those for your patients, but I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities. So what it really does is open the door um, without requiring, and this is, you know, it's not, it has to get, so, but, but um, it wouldn't require going to a legislature every time there is something that would be reasonable to include as a part of a pharmacist scope of practice, um, which is really a laborious process. Our students did that fantastically with um, or self-administered hormonal contraception, but you know that's a very, very process. So um, it's really designed to have that be more in rule. So this committee is advisory to Doppel and the Board of Pharmacy. So coming up with ideas, making recommendations to Doppel, um, interprofessional groups. So not just pharmacists, but also um, physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs to then come together to just make those decisions. Um, so that the most similar that I can see is Oregon's has, has this as well. And they've gone through some of the public health drugs and some other things like cough and cold, prescription cough and cold products, things like that. So that can give kind of a picture. But um, the other thing that I think we still need to advocate for is payment for these services, um, insurance company payment. So certainly that is something that is really complementary to any kind of advocacy in this area. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for the info. Um, does anyone have anyone else have any follow up questions for that legislation right now, or for Dr. Gunning? And uh, I guess opening up for any other questions for anyone as well. And I guess I do have. Sorry, I'll continue to talk then too for uh, Dr. Miller. Um, as far as your role um, with industry right now too, do you consider yourself more of like a uh, medical science liaison that a lot of pharmacists do that way or more in the way of sales? Or is it kind of a combination? I'm, I'm technically in the sales division. Um, I'm not an MSL, um, although I, I work with, with them closely and I've I've been called a unicorn because I kind of transitioned away from the clinical. Um, so my job really is to build business relationships um, with the health plans and the PBMs, uh, working closely with their pharmacy directors. And then ultimately at times, depending on the situation, I will be involved in contract negotiation um, as well. I think I'm, I'm the only one on my team and actually have been for a other companies as well that's a pharmacist in this role. And I think it gives me a huge leg up as I'm talking to the pharmacy directors and medical directors because, you know, not only am I a pharmacist and I can relate to them clinically, but I've also, you know, been at the health plan and so I've kind of sat in their chair. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really feel like having, you know, being a pharmacist myself is a huge advantage and my teammates often, you know, rely on me to kind of translate some of the deep clinical that we have to educate ourselves on about our drugs to, to help them better understand it. So I still feel like, um, and will always be a pharmacist deep in my heart um, and definitely think it brings an advantage to me from a career perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So I, 
always been uh, very interested in that area of pharmacy or just that area of healthcare too, to, I guess, like you're saying, have a leg up with the sales portion, but even with the other side, just to have the background knowledge with the pharmacy, with the medicine type of thing too. So. Yeah, makes a difference. Awesome. I guess. Dr. Miller, I totally remember seeing your picture in the composites. Uh, <laughs> You remember those? How many I do. People, how many people were in your Farm B class? Um, I think there were five. Yeah, five in mine. Well, is from 1997. Um, I'm sure the graduates that are on this call cannot fathom having a class of five people, including the males. I we only had one male in our class, so it was um, four women and male, which made it super fun. I think for him, so. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a different, uh, a different environment. That's for sure back then. I can say, I think in my graduating class, there was 48. And even now people mm -hmm. say that that's a very low number. So I don't. <laughs> Crazy. I, I, um, I have the opportunity. I am involved in a pharmacy organization called the Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy or AMCP. Hopefully some of you have heard of it and um, they have a diplomat program. And so I'm involved with the University of Colorado uh, Pharmacy School and working with those students. And it's always fun to get involved, but it, it is a little crazy. I'll do lectures uh, for them occasionally and you walk in into a big auditorium and just thinking, you know, you've got a hundred or more students there all getting their farm Ds. It's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I know at least the university or not university of Utah, but Utah has their own chapter of AMCP, I believe mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. that is run by a few awesome pharmacists here. So it's always just another one of those organizations to get involved in as, as if uh, students didn't have enough to get involved in there too, right. but it's another way to uh, get, get there as well. So. Right. Awesome. I guess, does anyone else have any uh, questions, comments for the college right now? Okay. Well, if there are not any other questions, I might uh, let everyone go a little bit early here too. So um, once again, if, well, if there's any other questions that come up, feel free to uh, contact once again, me or Ryan, and uh, we can go over anything there. Um, also, once again, final plug, anyone who wants to join the Alumni Association, please do. It's free. It's uh, yeah, very fun to stay involved with everything here too. So, but yeah, if there's nothing else, I'll let everyone go. And I really appreciate everyone for coming. Hi, thanks. Great to see you all. So good to see all of you as of you hiding without your cameras on, but <laughs> great to see your names too. Take care. Good to see you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Great job, Kevin. Karen, thanks so much. Thanks, Randy. Yeah.